We are here on day four of our San Diego road trip. And we're starting today at the USS Midway Museum here in downtown San Diego. We were actually on an aircraft carrier. It was commissioned in 1945, just toward the end of World War II. And it was decommissioned in 1992. But it was used during the Vietnam War, as well as the first Gulf War. And it held up to 80 planes on this deck. Now we just started the tour, but we already talked to a World War II veteran. I uh, got our pictures taken with him. Below deck is also some simulators and you can see the quarters of the uh, officers. So there's a lot to see here. You can spend 45 hours here if you want to. So I don't know how long this tour is going to take, but uh, we're happy to be here. So if you come to San Diego, you got to come to the USS Midway Museum because San Diego is known for its naval presence, both in the present and in the past. Looking forward to walking around and I hope you enjoy the tour. He was in, he was in the year. Yeah. Well, I was only 14, so I had to wait a couple of years. Oh, yeah. 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 So I went in 44. Oh, she want to take the back? Okay. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> that looks good. Wow. So, were you on the Midway? No, it wasn't ready for World War II. That's right, it was, it was right after. after oh, or, yeah. yeah. Bunker Hill, Boxer, and Tarawa. Those are the ships that I flew on. Wow. That must have been crazy. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Can't imagine what that was like yeah. back then. He did the same thing. He, he was a Polish kid who lived next door to me. Right. And uh, he, there were nine of us, and he, he said, no, I'm going in the Air Force. I want to go to Europe. He said, I want to fight the, the Germans. Yeah. Because his family all came from Poland. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he, he did about 20, I think 22, 23 missions over Germany. <laughs> and, uh, he just passed away last year. Oh, right. How old were you when you joined the Air Force, right? The Air Force? 17. 17, wow. My boy is seven, was 17 when he got in uh, the Army, too. Yeah. <laughs> That's me at, at 20, 23, over, way over oh, there. Wow. The black well, nice meeting you. Okay, enjoy your tour. All right. aircraft carriers, and I say bulk because I ended up buying airplanes later in my career from the Navy, uh, which was
is a lot less fun. <laughs> it is what it is. So we're going to talk about landing on a carrier naturally. And uh, what you need is an airplane with a tail hook. And you need an arresting gear wire. And if you're almost there. Almost. <laughs> not quite three. You probably heard about the Midway down below. It was uh, commissioned right two weeks after the World War II. Assigned to surrender in Japan. You anyway, see, uh, Midway was commissioned right into World War II, and its a, it, and its two sister ships were designed to actually go attack Japan. And they were built, constructed with all the, the lessons of World War II. One was remember kamikaze pilots hitting decks and, and dropping bombs, and carriers got decommissioned real fast and couldn't do anything. This deck is three and a half inches of steel. The deck below us. Uh, hangar bay is two inches of steel. The deck below that is two inches of steel. So it's real hard for those those old old time bombs to the bombers to get into the deck and decommission the carrier. So the, this was the is you is probably known as the first super carrier, if you will, that was ever designed. Twelve arresting gears, two uh, hydraulic catapults, 135 airplanes on board, piston operated airplanes you know, like like we have back here with the C1. It's pretty easy to land planes back then, relatively speaking, because the approach speed coming in was uh, a lot slower. You had 30 knots of wind coming over the deck because that's what we always did. We, you fly into the wind at carriers to lower the approach speed. He's coming in at maybe 80, 90 knots, so you got a approach speed of 40, 50 knots. Pretty slow, you know, and it. Uh, was pretty tame, but not completely. I mean, if he misses a wire, he hits a barricade, and hopefully he never hits the planes that are spotted up here in the front. Back then, they um, they used a, a guy, the landing signal officer, used a thing called paddles back here. They're back of the ship there, somewhere back here, and he's he's trying to, to steer the pilot. In. If he's going like this, is you're you're just right where you need to be. If he goes like this, you're going too high. If he goes like this, you're too low. Left, right, and so forth. And then if he goes like this, that means cut. Cut back then meant uh, pull off your throttles, and the plane just kind of falls out of the air into the landing zone and catches the wire, and you're good to go. Well, when they got jet airplanes, all that stuff went away. Now you've got a, a hundred knot landing differential speed it's going really fast this you can't do with a straight deck carrier so the navy back in the 50s fort late 40s 50s came up with a concept called the angle deck and actually this is the brits the brit british actually were doing this with the angle decks back then the midway went into the yards in 1957 56 57 and it was a, a an angle deck was put on the carrier so now we had a, an air landing area that uh, we could use. And so now what was unique about this? Well, we have three wires instead of 12, and we have a barricade. In case we can't make the three wires, there's a barricade in extreme circumstances. But what happens if you miss the three wires, you can go around and try it again. You couldn't do that over here. You, know, you miss the wires, you either go into the barricade or you know, you're, anyways you're done. And it's a little more dangerous to go into the barricade. So that was the, the idea there too. And then the final configuration of the uh, midway was two steam catapults. And that, after you're done here, you might want to go up uh, front and see the, on the bow there the two steam catapults. They talk about the uh, two huge hydraulic pistons that, that shoot the plane off. Uh, two and a half seconds, zero to 160. <sighs> Man, it's a thrill, a real thrill. By the way, the landing area here from the number one wire to the number two wire is 40 feet. From the number two wire to the number three wire is 40 feet. So it's 80 feet. It's the size of a, a tennis court to get the, uh, the, plane, the planes landed. Now, one of the other innovations, by having paddles out there, the LSO now uses this, this system called a uh, Fresnel lens. The Fresnel, Fresnel lens has, it's a beam of light, and there's actually beams of light coming out of each one of these. But you have to be in that beam to see it, kind of like the stoplights when you go to uh, you know, some of the uh, intersections. And so you want to have, you want to see this light as a pilot all the time, is that center light right there, lined up with these data lights. Then you know you're you're right where you're supposed to be on a glide slope coming down to the aircraft. If you're off by a foot below the glide slope, 
you're going to be 16 feet off down here. So you want to constantly try to get that ball centered when you're coming down. It's real important. And you got an LSO back there that's helping you with that too, by the way. The Fresnel lens, by the way, is gyro stabilized. So if the deck is pitching, which is one of the problems, it's going up and down like this. This is the light is stabilized, so it's it's following you, not following uh, the deck. And that's uh, that's critical and important. If you see this red light, you're probably going to get this LSO to say he's going to wave you off and say come around again and try it again. This is an F-18 that just uh, trapped. You can see uh, he caught the uh, number one wire. That's not good. You don't want to catch the number one wire. That means you're too far back, too close to what we call the, the potato locker, where they store the potatoes back underneath the ship. Oh. <laughs> you don't want to hit the, the round down on the back of the ship. I've seen that happen. It's, it's not a pretty thing. So you want to make sure you're on that loud slope and you're hitting the number two wire. Number three wire is okay, because you're not going to hurt anybody. You, you just might miss the number three wire, and then you have to bring it around. Pilots are constantly graded on their landings, and the LSOs do that. And they, they'll come back and they'll they'll tell you, well, you know, you're right for lineup, you're too high, too low, settle in the middle, blah blah. Okay, three wire, you know, something like that. And they, down in the, the ready room, they'll have what they call a greeting board, where they're scored. They put their their scores for all the all their landings during the cruise. And there's always an overhead tanker stations flying over here to catch them if they have a problem with uh, the fuel state. So here he goes, he's going to land. Hopefully he hits the number two wire. And, and as soon as he hits that deck, he puts the throttles all the way to the firewall, full power, because he doesn't know if he's caught that wire. Poor visibility, maybe the, the deck is pitching. A little bit not so nice conditions for flying. You can see this this is a pilot to land. You can see the, the herky jerky thing that happens back there. This is an F-35, this is the newest jet. You can see the uh, flight surface is going all over the place. More than likely this is not a pilot line landing. I'm an, ad, an older airplane, we've got one of these on up, up, up forward. He's coming in with the no flaps. Uh, did battle damage airplane in, in, in the Vietnam War. And he's going to come in here extremely fast. It's it's pretty frightening how fast, how fast he's going. He's like 200 knots. See that? Oof. Fortunately, he caught the uh, the wire, and, uh, and it was stopped by the by the, the barricade. And then you can see where the, the nose gear collapsed as a result of the landing. And then you get the fire and rescue crew to come up and immediately get him out of the airplane because you don't know. There's going to be a fire that uh, suddenly engulfs that airplane at that time. So, and that's the end of the story. You're all qualified now to fly. Thank you. Are they serving food? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you can yeah. chew some of that. There's a chow on wow. it. Wow. It doesn't look too good. But it's... French soap, too.
jelly. Hopefully we see the white dot all the way to the back. And all the way to the back is like 12 feet. It's not a lot. The brig. The brig is the jail. Ugh. He does not look happy. The brig. Here it is.
What are you in for? Sir? Oh, you're, yeah. you're a mannequin, sorry. Photo spot. <laughs> So in back of me, way in back of me, is the USS Midway, where we just spent five hours touring. It's the USS Midway Museum. We spent most of the time on the flight deck, which is really cool. But you see in back of me a 25-foot statue called Unconditional Surrender, or also known as the Kissing, the Kissing Statue. And this is based on a famous 1945 Times Square photo where a sailor just grabbed a random woman and started kissing her to celebrate the end of World War II. So this is a little bit bigger than the real life size of the, uh, the couple involved. I don't know what happened to both of them afterward. I think they might have uh, had a reunion many, many years later. I'm not sure. I'll have to look that up. But if you come to the USS Midway Museum, when you exit, you got to walk all the way around and make sure you get your picture taken next to this statue, the kissing statue.